and expand it into this guy. And I love this play. I play a lot of uh, Lycan Rock decks. If you go first, you can't attack. You don't need the double colorless. Getting one energy on that Rock Ruff, ready to then use a dangerous Rogue GX later in the game absolutely crucial and I don't think Kid could have had a much better start than he did he's got two Zorua he's got the Alolan Grimer it looks like in the active there and then he's also got the Rock off on the bench with the energy and Greg here it's he not that's right he doesn't have quite as much or generally no. speaking decks have a lot of ways to turn as mentioning the private deck To draw ever pseudo block of down sky here. That's actually really big. It limits Zoroark's damage output, which is lovely. One thing I must mention, looking at Kid Stark's um, his deck list here, he actually has taken a he's taken a page out of Tord Reklev's book. He's playing three copies of Bridget, and that's what players do. The theory is, once I get my Zoroark out, I can use trade, and I'm golden. I need to get the Zoroark out. How do I do that? It is all about making sure I get that turn one Bridget. Playing three copies is big. Now, he does play the Tapu Lele, and he uses it to grab himself a Guzma. That's right. Still got that Alolan Grimer. It's not that Alolan Muck isn't coming out, but he wanted to get the Zoroark in the active. He had a choice between taking a prize or getting the, the Alolan Muck that turn. He went for taking a prize. I can't disagree with that. Oh yeah, absolutely. Now, over on Greg's side, it looks like he's finally beginning to stabilize his setup. We notice that he runs, in the active position, a Tapu Koko. That card with its flying flip ability lets you deal 20 damage to all of your opponent's Pokémon. Well, I'm not really sure with, given how good Kid's setup is, how helpful that will be. I think that it could have the potential of putting some Pokemon in range. However, if I'm in Greg's shoes, I'm wanting to go a little bit more aggressive, where you can do little bits of damage to things, or a whole lot of damage to one thing. Yeah, I agree with you entirely there. I mean, he has got the free retreat on the Tapu Koko. The thing is, Kid doesn't even need a Skyfield to get a KO on that Tapu Koko. He needs one more bench Pokemon, and that's another prize. If Greg here could maybe get a double colorless for the Zoroark, you're going to be two hit KOing unless you get, you know, the Skyfield and a huge bench, etc. Maybe getting that first hit on the opposing Zoroark could be a good deal, but we actually uh, see a Guzma here. We see a Guzma from Greg. He's just returning fire, and it looks like he has knocked out the Rockruff with exactly enough damage with Riotous beating. Kid was threatening times the number of benched Pokemon. So both of these decks run lots of benched Pokemon. It's a big deal. And that's a fighting Pokemon. And Zoroark is weak to fighting. And even with a double colorless energy, Claw Slash does 110. That's enough to pick up the knockout. I said to myself how much I loved the basic energy on the Rock Rough turn one. I thought it was a great play. It was a really good shout. Unfortunately, Greg saw the same thing that we yeah. did. And he was like, no, 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 no. I ain't falling for that one. <laughs> Seems like having that turn one Bridget where Kid has multiple approaches he could take. He could go deep and go long to try to get exactly 210 damage to knock out the active Zoark GX. That would put him in a very good position. That's lots of resources that Greg would lose. Or if he fails to get that, another thing he could do is reuse or use another Guzma we saw last turn from both players to knock out that Zorua on the bench for a cheap prize. Yeah, and that would be really good, just limiting the options. There's a Zoroark already in play, but that guarantees that Greg will not have a second Zoroark the following turn. We do see Kid playing around with Propagation here on the Execute, that amazing ability. You get to drag it from the discard into your hand, but every time you discard it, it resets the ability. So you can pull it into the hand, discard it to use trade. Pull it into the hand, discard it to use trade. Pull it into your hand, combine it with another card, discard it to use Ultra Ball. It's so 
good in these lower walk decks. Hey, Ross, you know, we've been talking a little bit about this, but it seems like we've seen maybe our first or one of the first Rainbow Rare Zora GXs all day. <laughs> we were talking about this during the last round, that we've not seen any Rainbow Rare Zoroarks, despite how many Zoroark there are. And it's almost like Kid was like, oh... You haven't, have you? Yeah. Let me join in. I mean, I love the Rainbow Rares. They are beautiful cards, but they don't do us money favors on the streaming. They no. are not the easiest card to differentiate. No, and they don't do you guys back at home any money favors either because there's a different rarity of this card. It comes in a promo box. It's very easy to get. That might be one of the reasons why these Zorar GX decks are so popular. But also, a lot of players, for whatever reason, one or another, might be preference, might be just... Finances prefer the normal rare Zorak, which is up on the screen right now. Yeah, I mean, I like the I like the art on the GXs generally. I must confess, I I just like the regular art GXs. Call me a loser if you will. Now we see another rainbow rare, but from context at least, we can tell this is going to be a Tapu Lele. <laughs> That's right. And I'm going to be honest, I like your Guzma play here, John. I'll, there's plenty of options. He doesn't have to use that. He might go for a draw supporter like a Congress, Oh, yeah, looks like it. Yeah, <laughs> and he's still got the opportunity to maybe go long later on. Now, you notice that he has tilted his Zork a little bit to the right from his perspective. For you guys back at home, that's probably like a 45-degree angle. Now, some players like to do that to show that they've used their ability. That's not to be confused with status conditions, which require you to flip. Instead, he flips in kind of a special angle. It, you don't have to do it, but it's helpful, and it keeps track of things. So, good job, kid great for us. Now, I love what Kid's doing here. He went and got the Colrus. Now, unbeknownst to us, as I said yesterday, we don't have the same information they do. He knew he could bench a Rockruff. He knew he could bench a Shaman, draw some more cards, hopefully bench more Pokemon. So what looked like a Colrus to six is already becoming a Colrus to nine, and potentially even more depending on what's in his hand. I didn't think Colrus to six was a great play because there's other, po there's other supporter cards you can use. But now he's going to use an Ultra Ball, which he might go for the Alolan Mark. He might go for a basic chorus to 10 oh and it looks like he's going for the shaman so that now I, i'm not sure exactly what's in his hand or not i think going for the shaman is the correct play either way because that lets him get more cards its ability setup lets you draw until you have six he could be digging yep there we go that's exactly why he played it he was digging for that choice band he only runs so many the odds are tough but off that chorus to six he drew he hasn't even played basics. the chorus yet he still got he the chorus it. in his hand. No, he, oh my goodness. He got I... the chorus and then started... Because I didn't love the chorus to six, but now he's just been benching stuff. And at least I don't think he played the chorus. I, I think he played it for six and then hit a couple of those basics oh. and then... He's got the KO anyway. He's, he's got, he's got the KO. He hasn't so. actually said that yet. He's yeah. hitting 210. This is a yep, there we KO. go. Okay, maybe he did play the chorus for. Either way, he's got the KO. That is by far the most important thing. And that is huge. That's why he didn't go for the Guzma. The Guzma to get a cheeky KO on Zoru was good. But now, I mean, would you rather he had a Zoro with a double colorless on his field? Or would you rather he had a Zorua? Greg's setup here is poor right now. Very his fault. Very he's poor. Not got well, much. Yeah, well, it could. it's also the fault of math in a sense, which is a combined <laughs> thing. It's a, it's a little bit of luck, but remember, you always have control of your list. However, two Bridget is a totally reasonable number to play. The difference between... Difference between running two Bridget and three is one of those very nitpickety things where if you're buying a theme deck for the first time, you're probably not too worried about that. You're just ready to have fun, enjoy the game. And these guys are ready to have fun and enjoy the game too. But when you're at this really high competitive level, every little bit counts. And remember, odds are an important part of the game. Yeah, I mean, it's not my fault. It's Math's fault. Cannot blame yeah. you for that one. I mean, Greg here, he's not out of this game, but he's going to need hes going to need some big explosive turn. Yeah. He's going to need the Zoroark, the double colorless energy, the choice band. There's already a Skyfield in play, which helps him, but he's going to need to go up to eight Pokemon on, on his bench. I mean, essentially, yeah. Greg needs to do what Kid just did. And it looks like he's playing an N here, so he's going to five cards. N lets you shuffle your hand into your deck, draw cards up to the number, not up to, that's a little older, but a card, but uh, <laughs> the exact amount as you have in prizes. So Kid will be drawing three, Greg will be drawing five. So we were just talking about math, hating math. I think Greg might be hating math right now because he has relatively low odds to hit exactly what he needs for any knockout. And it looks like he didn't hit much of anything, did he? 
No, that is not the hand he was looking for. And he just concedes again. Oh, yeah. And I like this. This is a 50-minute Swiss round. They don't have much time. And it's a bit of a mirror match. And the thing is, you don't necessarily have those options for the huge comebacks in the mirror like you would in other games. Had Greg got on a big KO on the Zorwart that turn, they even up at free prizes. Maybe he can bring it back. But it wasn't just that Greg was down by a couple of prizes. Kid had two Zoroark in play. Kid had the double colourless, I think, on both Zoroark. So Greg knew that Kid was going to keep KOing and keep KOing, unless Greg got the KO that turn. And even if he did, it was not in his favour. But when he didn't, he knew there was no way he won that game. He's not playing Parallel City. He's not playing these counter right. games. Yeah, however, going into the next game, Greg's nowhere near out of this series because he has a very special inclusion in his deck card called Hex Maniac, that, whereas Kid does not. Hex Maniac is a card from an older set. When you play it, it shuts off all abilities until the end of your opponent's turn. You see on the screen right there that Zora GX, its whole focus of the deck is that ability trade, lets you discard cards that are bad, lets you draw more cards you set up so when you're playing against this mirror match that ross was talking about this is kind of a mirror in a sense where both are playing zoroark hex maniac is very very important if you're able to pull it off easily because if you play multiple hex maniacs back to back to back to back remember you run vs seeker which lets you get back supporters you run puzzle of time which lets you get back anything when you play two at the same time it's a big deal and so if greg just stabilizes and sets up he might be able to pull this off yeah, I mean, we sat down, as we do at the beginning of rounds, we looked through the deck list, and we said, yeah, it's fairly standard, nothing jumps out, and then we said, hang on a second, Greg's playing Hex and Kid isn't. That might be an equaliser in this game. And let's face it, we saw that last game, Kid had to turn one Bridget without even using a Tapu Lele. Greg had to end, and he got a couple of basics, but it wasn't the same. Yeah. Greg's setup was a lot worse, and when your decks are largely doing similar things... You need that. The other thing is, Kid has the Lycan Rock option, and that is also something which is huge in this particular matchup. Greg has better use of Ace Roller, hitting for single energy with Golisopod and Zoroark using Ace Roller to heal and recycling. That's fine! But Lycan Rock's going to get a one-hit KO. So if you Ace Roller better, but your opponent can take a big one-hit KO, that's another thing that's going to be big. Greg needs to set up, he needs to go after the Lycan Rock, and he needs to really rely on his Hex Maniac throughout the game. It is absolutely winnable for Greg, but Kid's one game up, and he's got Lycan Rock. Although there is a certain trade-off since this is a Golisopod deck that Greg is using. It's Zorark, but it's also Golisopod. Golisopod is a grass type. Lycan Rock is a fighting type, but it's weak to grass, meaning that the amount of damage that Golisopod does to Lycan Rock is doubled. So once Kid plays a Lycan Rock GX down, he's committing himself to potentially losing two very cheap, very easy prizes. Oh, you're absolutely correct, and that is one of the fun interactions of this matchup. I'd still rather be in Kid's position in that situation, oh, yeah. because you get to control, you get to dictate. You get to choose. You yeah. get to choose when you evolve that, that Rock Ruff, so you're able to go from a little Rock Ruff to 200 HP, but more importantly, you're able to score a knockout whenever you're ready, so sometimes you can wait until the end of the game to evolve and use that ability, Bloodthirsty Eyes, Works kind of like a Guzma at that knockout. So it looks like Greg is still Greg mulliganing. Is, he's, he's had two mulligans, yeah. and I love. Thank you to the judge, really helping us out here. He's put a couple of he's put a dice up or die up on the deck of Kid to denote how many mulligans there have been. And this is an awkward situation. I think I saw a Bridget in Greg's hand. Generally, it always used to be if your opponent mulligans, they're getting a, a few mulligan. You're giving your opponent extra cards. You want to end them. There's a handshake. And they're ready to go. It looks like. Greg, and now you may be wondering whether or not to go first or second going into the next game, but you've seen throughout all day long that players who have lost the first game generally prefer to go first. And I don't mean just generally, I mean almost unanimously, because <laughs> you get so many options, you get the first chance to evolve, you get the first chance to attach energy, and... Turn 1 gets this. Turn 1 gets this. <laughs> Nobody so, wants to be turn one gets it. So we've got a puzzle of time, a single puzzle of time. That's the other effect of puzzle of time. If you play one by itself. It wasn't a bridge, it was a hex maniac I saw. That's Rex right. hand is bad. It is. I mean, unless I'm missing something or he's playing pretty creatively, it looks like he needed to play that hex maniac to slow kid down. Because remember, we were talking about all the different ways to get to Bridget and 
Most of those pathways to Bridget involve using an ability, so it's pretty clever to make the best out of a bad situation using that Hex Maniac, forcing Kid to have one of those three Bridgets or his computer search in his hand versus an Ultra Ball or a Tapu Lele for Wonder Tag to get one from your deck. Yeah, I mean, whenever you see somebody on turn one using a single puzzle of time to rearrange the top three cards of their deck, that means there is no end coming, there nope. is no Professor Sycamore coming, nope. there is no Bridget coming, because nope. all of those cards would mean you really would not bother playing the puzzle of time. So, and then when they drop a Hex Maniac, then, I mean, don't get me wrong, that double colorless is all right. It means an armor press might come from Glycopod next turn, hitting for 100, reducing damage by 20. If he gets something next turn, if he goes Glycopod grass energy, that's actually not not bad, but he still needs right. to set up. Right, I think he can definitely take control of the game if that is in his hand and if he gets that next turn. But it looks like the Hex Maniac has really tripped up Kid right here because just taking a peek at the cards he's flashing to us, he's discarding multiple cards for Ultra Ball. It looks like he doesn't actually have a Bridget by itself in his hand. Oh, and that's big. He would, I mean, this would be an Ultra Ball for a Tapulele for a Bridget. It would definitely be that. Yeah. But he doesn't have that right now. So the Hex main, this is what we were talking about in between games one and two. This is yep. actually a big thing. And he has slowed Kid down. And I didn't see what he what he's going to get from the single puzzle. But if he gets something like a Sycamore from the single puzzle, that Hex Maniac has literally just pulled him back into the game. Exactly, but... In addition to that, not only has he been pulled back into the game, but Greg's kind of pulled Kid down into the exact same spot that he's in because Greg's like, well, you know what, my hand is probably not that good, but let's make the most out of it. And Kid right now, I mean, it looks like he just doesn't have as much to work with either, so he's waiting and praying. Evo Soda, now that is another card which jumped out. Search your deck for a Pokemon that evolves from one of your Pokemon on the field and evolve it. That's huge, because now you get that Glycopod up. I like Evo Soda. It's another one of those tricks we see in Expanded that works very, very nicely. The question is, does he have anything else? Grass Energy, he gets a KO. But if he doesn't have a Grass Energy and he doesn't have a Supporter, this won't help him very much. He's got the Glycopod, but it's just going to sit there taking a hit. Well, unfortunately, it. Unless I see. It, yeah, oh, he's playing another single puzzle. I think I saw a couple Ace Arola in his hand. You can't even play that card the way that Greg's board is right now. He's got. A, it's Ace Arola and two double yeah. colorless. I, yeah, two double colorless. You're absolutely it's right. And it looks like hand. he's just sitting on it. He's just. I think he put a Bridget to the top of his deck, which okay. is not all that helpful. Because turn three, Bridget. And it's not like he has nothing after the Bridget. Yeah. Now, the horrible thing that we just saw on Greg's side is that two turns in a row, he's played Puzzle of Time. So what that means is he looked at the top three cards of his deck the first turn, and they were all bad. But this last turn that Greg played, he was able to get a not-so-bad one to put on the top of the deck. So he might be able to stabilize. Now, going back to Kid, it looks like he's going to make the play that he wanted to last turn. And that's not bad. The thing is, Greg, he's had two turns. So kids sitting there going, okay, okay, well, I didn't get what I wanted, but you know what? It's fine because I've still got what well, I've still got a bit of a setup. I've got a better setup than you. He actually chooses to go for a Zorua there, which I like. He had a Shaman in hand. He didn't need the Tapu Lele. He gets a new hand of six cards. He's got trade available to him. And he actually forewent the Tapu Lele. And I don't mind this because he clearly didn't need it. And there is a situation here, and it's quite a lot to ask for. Kid could win this this turn. He could. That's absolutely right, Rick, because we were talking about that earlier. We saw that in the last game where Kid was able to get a full bench of Pokemon. That's eight Pokemon, so Riotus beating 20 times each Pokemon you have in play. That would be nine Pokemon, 180 damage with Skyfield in play. Play that Choice Band, which Kid already has. He's not going to have any trouble finding it. Get the win by this turn potentially, which would be incredible. I mean, he's actually not that far away. He's got the energy on the Rockruff to retreat. He's got the choice ban. He needs Skyfield for, and he's got the double colorless. Yeah. And there's a shame. If he gets a Skyfield and three more bench Pokemon, that's... And oh, and he got the Skyfield. And he's got a Professor Sycamore. And, and he's got a computer search. He might well do it this turn. If he can just get three more bench Pokemon, oh my gosh. he's going to take the win. And you know what? He might even take the shortcut to show everything to Greg, but if, if he doesn't have all of that 
in his hand right now, then he's only going to be like a card or two away from being able to do it. So and then he's playing a professor. I mean, you've got to think now he's just going to computer search for a Pokemon. Shaman yeah. if he's got it, but I don't believe he does. I think he only plays two Shaman. He doesn't look like he plays a battle no, compressor. No, he only plays two Shaman. But there's another Pokemon. Plays the... Oh, he's got a Bridget! There he is! And there we go! He wins it! Yeah. Plays the Bridget, grabs his wow. two Pokemon, 210 on turn two for the victory! Wow, that was incredible. <laughs> that was incredible. I bet Kid's happy about that. that. That's something else. Now, these decks, they're very reliable. They have lots of ways to draw cards, especially... Later on in the game, after you've gotten a Zorark GX or two out into play to use multiples of those trade abilities. So you're drawing card after card after card. And I think he drew about like 17 plus cards that he turn. Drew a lot of cards. And the thing is, you maybe not don't do that all the time. He got the turn to 210, which is crazy good. But he had to really overextend to do it. In some matchups, your opponent gets rid of the Skyfield, etc., and it all goes wrong. But in that matchup, it was nice and simple. It was, if I hit 210, I win the game right now. And in that situation, it's worth overextending. It's worth going for it because you know, instead of some long back and forth, can I pull it out game, I can put myself at another win right there. The second definitely paid off for him exactly and when you're in those spots sometimes you have to pay the risk benefit risk reward try to figure out exactly whether or not it's worth to extend so much but when you have literally a game winning situation right in front of you it ends up being a no-brainer if you think eh, my odds are at least 50 50 maybe i can make it a little bit better especially if i draw like a shaman which kid was able to do was that that Last turn, that was two Shaman in a he row, was wasn't two it? Two Shaman in a row, yeah. and then I think he had a Professor Sycamore in hand, but he ended up with a Bridget as well. So rather than Sycamoreing and hoping he hit the Pokemon, he just went, ah, I'll use a Bridget. It was one condition. And, yeah, that's all you need sometimes. That was such, such a good play. Because he could have initially used a Tapu Lele for the Bridget, but then in that situation, you're thinking, hang on a second, do I actually, I might not have the Sky Field. It's a risky play. Yeah. But what's not risky is the interview we're just that's about right. to do with our winner. So don't go anywhere, because we're going to be back in a matter of seconds.